Welcome to this lecture on international taxation as part of the International Centre for Tax and Development's Capacity Building Programme. My name is Martin Hearson. I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK and I lead uh, ICTD's work on international tax. Worth mentioning that this lecture is being recorded in July 2021. Some of the things I'll talk about are uh, ongoing policy debates um, at the time of recording and so things might have changed since um, since the lecture was recorded. So in this lecture I'm going to begin by talking about what international taxation is, um, both how we might define the scope of what we're talking about and then also the particular challenges it creates and the reasons why uh, governments have spent quite a lot of effort addressing it as a topic. Um, then we'll talk about what governments have done, how they tackle the challenges that emerge from international taxation. After that, we'll look at um, the tools they've created and the issues those tools produce for lower income countries who, by and large, were not involved in the development of those tools, but um, increasingly are starting to apply them and participate in them. Um, after that, we'll talk briefly about some of the recent developments that have been ongoing in the area of taxation of the digital economy. And finally, we'll just draw a few conclusions. So what do we mean by international taxation? So for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to define it as the taxation of income generation that takes place across borders. So what we mean by that is a situation in which somebody, whether that's an, uh, a natural person or a business who's resident in one jurisdiction, earns income in another jurisdiction. Um, that might occur for several reasons. The first might be because that person has physically traveled to the other jurisdiction and done something there that's created income. Maybe they live part of the time in one jurisdiction and have a job there, but then they spend the rest of the time in another jurisdiction, for example. Um, it may be that they have an investment in another jurisdiction. So uh, there can be two types of investment that I think are important for us here. There's a direct investment in um, in a business activity there such as a factory um, and then there's holding wealth um, in some kind of um, instrument such as a bank account uh, in another jurisdiction um, and then finally um, there's the provision of services now this is a, a as the economy changes a more and more important way in which taxation or taxpayers become uh, internationalized so here somebody might provide services to somebody in another jurisdiction in a way that generates value for them um, but they may do that in a way which doesn't actually require any of those first two things they don't have to physically go there um, and they don't have to actually own anything outright in, that's physically located in the jurisdiction but they're still conducting an activity that creates income in the other jurisdiction now defining it in this way um, rules out a couple of things that we're not going to talk about. So we're not going to talk about um, the ta about uh, taxation of transactions. So we're not going to talk about um, uh, taxation of trade in goods and services where there's no value generation, no income generation occurring. Um, that's indirect taxation and that's a topic um, which is also potentially international in scope, but it's not within the scope of what we're talking about in this lecture. Um, and the other uh, thing we're not going to talk about is international taxes in the sense of proposals for taxes that may be raised at an international level. Um, and the proposal for a financial transactions tax is one example of that. So we're not going to talk about either of those two things. We're going to focus on the taxation of income that is generated in a cross-border situation. Now, uh, to understand the challenges that are created by um, international taxation. I'm going to use um, this trilemma concept, which emerges from work by um, Philip Genschel and Thomas Rickson. Um, and they argue that there's three different parts to the puzzle. And, and the point of a trilemma is that you can only ever successfully resolve two out of these three. You can't resolve all three at the same time. So governments have to make some kind of choice. So the first part of it is double taxation. The situation that emerges where cross-border income generating activity is taxed more than once by different governments uh, with the risk that they might deter that activity from taking place. The second challenge is tax competition. That's when governments uh, use the fact that uh, economic activity is going across borders. They try to attract that activity to their country 
uh, through um, through some form of preferential tax treatment. We'll talk much more about that. Um, and the final challenge, which is kind of a framing one that affects the way in which solutions to the other two are chosen, is that governments like to retain sovereignty over their tax matters. And that means they are not willing to um, give up as much power, especially over the making of tax policy, as there may be in some other areas of economic cooperation. So essentially, this trilemma concept says you can solve um, you can solve the problem of double taxation and you can retain tax sovereignty, but only at the cost of tax competition and so on. So, as I said, double taxation is the situation in which economic activity that takes place across borders is taxed more than once in the different countries in which it's taking place, different jurisdictions in which it's taking place. Um, so to explain what that might look like, I've got a simple diagram here um, and it shows just a simple oversimplified schema of a multinational company just for our thought experiment purposes. So in this situation, you have a headquarters country. That's where the multinational company is based. That's where it has its head office. Um, that's where its board meets probably. Um, and maybe that might be the country in which it has a lot of its sales. Um, then you have country A, that's the country in which its factory is located, that's where its manufacturing activities take place. And you have country B, and that's the country in which uh, it does much of its research and development and maybe some of its other services such as marketing and so on. So it has different types of economic activity in those three countries. Um, now, if there's no coordination, um, you might well find that the headquarters country says, well, we consider ourselves um, to have the right to tax the profits made from the the whole value chain of this of this business because ultimately it's a company based in in, in our country. Um, the country with the factory might say, well, the product is made in our country, and so we think we've got the right to tax the profits made from selling that product. And country B might say, well, we a lot of the uh, most important work that went into developing that product to giving it its value well that took place in our country and so we think we've got the right to tax it and so untangling um, uh, how you might prevent a situation occurring in which all three countries are claiming uh, an overlapping taxing right over the um, over the profits made from producing a product um, is is the challenge for resolving the problem of double taxation The second problem that can occur when economic activity is, is taking place across borders is tax competition. And I'm going to talk about that in two different categories, uh, real and virtual. This is the terminology used by Genschel and Rickson. Um, so if you talk about real tax competition first, this is competition for those real investments or those um, uh, real people. Um, uh, so competition using the tax system to try and attract people and uh, and substantive in, uh, direct investment into a country. Um, and there's really clear evidence that governments do compete. They do use their tax systems to try and attract investment uh, in particular. And there's some evidence that in some cases that works, but there's also some evidence that says, especially in the case of lower income countries, that much of that tax competition is redundant. That's to say um, that governments may think they can use their tax system to try and attract in investment, but actually um, it's often not uh, that big a consideration for investors um, choosing between particular countries in many situations. So um, real tax competition um, is kind of often evidenced by a graph such as this, which shows declining statutory Ta corporate tax rates. So this is the headline rate um, that you find in the government's legislation on uh, corporate profits. Um, so the different coloured lines here show um, the average rates for different regions. So we have um, in green, we have Africa. In light blue, we have Asia. Dark blue, we have Latin America and Caribbean. Um, and then in yellow, we have um, the OECD member states. Um, and we're looking at a 20 year period here. And in case you can't see it clearly, the y-axis here starts at 15% and goes up to 40%. So um, it's not as dramatic a change as it might look once you consider that we're, um, uh, all of the rates are above, all the average rates are above 15% throughout. Um, but what you can see is that consistently for each of these groups, there's been a decline in the average corporate tax rate. Um, 
And, and we know from um, research that's been done to look at why corporate tax rates decline that you can see governments responding to each other. Um, and you can also see that um, sometimes governments uh, uh, governments don't respond because of mitigating factors such as perhaps the, the political ideology of the government that's in power um, or the fiscal pressures on the government at a particular time, but that overall the trend is in one direction and it's actually quite rare for governments to increase their corporate tax rates, although actually in the post-COVID era we've seen a few notable uh, examples of governments doing that, something which throughout um, the previous period they'd never done. So headline rates are declining. But another strand in the literature says, while headline rates are declining, you, you have to look in, in detail at what's happening uh, 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 under the surface. And what you find is that what's actually happened is governments have, um, in many cases, restructured their tax systems. And what that means is certainly if you look at OECD countries, that um, corresponding with the decline in the headline rate has been an expansion of the base so the definition of profits on which that rate is charged such that actually there hasn't been a corresponding decline in tax in corporate tax revenue as a share of gdp um, so the picture is more complex than this if we look at just africa for a minute we can we'll certainly we can certainly see that um, corporate income tax revenue has been increasing um, as a share of GDP, um, even as headline rates have been declining. Um, and that's partly a product of more effective administration um, and partly a product of some base broadening measures. But tax competition is very much alive in Africa, even if we go beyond the headline rates. And one way that we can study that um, is to look at tax incentives. The so tax incentives are used by governments to offer investors um, a more attractive deal than the headline tax treatment that is uh, that is applicable to all businesses. So um, typically a foreign investor will qualify for a more generous tax treatment um, uh, because the government wants to track that investor in and sees that its neighbours might be offering some similar incentives. Um, uh, and because there's a kind of a strategic interaction here, one government looks at another, sees what it's doing and responds by doing the same thing, we can see that there has been a proliferation. So this, this data is quite old. It's taken from a paper published in 2009, um, but uh, it shows clearly that from that in that period, 1980 to 2005, many of the different categories of tax incentives became much more uh, prevalent across African countries. Um, which indicates that um, governments really were looking around at each other and they were they were copying each other and adopting new tax incentive measures. Um, now, the evidence that those tax incentives uh, work in the form that they're adopted um, is is not very strong. Um, and I think it's probably certainly the case that while we couldn't always say that all tax incentives are ineffective, many of those that have been adopted by governments have been somewhat redundant. Um, and on top of that, of course, if governments are merely looking at each other and, and copying, um, uh, it, it, the, the ideal situation will be one in which they kind of reach some kind of agreement by which they were going to uh, hold off in that competition amongst themselves. Um, so uh, while um, there may be some positive uh, gains to some governments from some tax incentives, overall, probably this situation, this lack of uh, cooperation between governments to prevent the race to the bottom um, has been quite costly in revenue terms. So a few years ago I did some work to try and estimate the revenue for gone through tax incentives by looking at the estimates that governments have prepared across a range of different lower income countries. Uh, and this is a result. Um, Essentially, what I found is that while while the figures vary quite widely, whether you measure it as a share of GDP or as a share of corporate income tax revenue, um, the figures are quite large. Um, for some countries, very large. Um, and there's a significant proportion of corporate income tax revenue that could be clawed back if governments were to suspend these tax incentives. If we work on the assumption that there's some amount of redundancy there, that some of them could be removed without uh, the investors who benefit from them leaving. So real tax competition overall is a phenomenon which we can measure whether we look at the headline rate uh, that applies across the board in legislation or the incentives that governments offer.
So a second type of tax competition is what we might call virtual tax competition. So as real tax competition is governments using their tax systems to try and acquire um, direct investment by multinationals that might lead to um, that might lead to the creation of, of jobs, um, the transfer of knowledge, uh, creation of infrastructure, um, or indeed to attract uh, individuals to move uh, to their country. Virtual tax competition is essentially competition for money, whether that is the paper profits of multinationals or whether that is the wealth of high net worth individuals. Um, and when governments seek to, 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 to compete in this way, um, it takes us into the terrain of what's often referred to as tax havens. So a tax haven is typically a, 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 a jurisdiction that um, seeks to attract, uh, attract money in that way. Um, by offering the opportunity to uh, investors to avoid or evade tax. So what uh, what do we mean by those two terms? It's really important to get them clarified. Although um, the definitions do vary, um, I'm gonna give you a, a set of definitions which I think is broadly, um, broadly accepted, but um, also probably has a bit of a bias towards the way the British legal system works. So tax avoidance um, is defined typically are something like um, efforts to comply with the letter of the law, but not the intention behind it. So to avoid a tax liability arising by exploiting the way in which the law is written um, in a way which probably the law actually did not intend to, to happen in that way. Um, when that happens in a transnational way, so when what you're trying to do is exploit um, the way in which different legal legal systems interact. Um, the term that often has been used was coined by the OECD is um, base erosion and profit shifting. So this in the international tax domain is most most commonly an issue in respect of multinational corporations um, and in that sense it mostly applies to corporate income tax although also to other taxes such as um, capital gains tax. Um, so the broad problem here is multinational companies are able to exploit the way in which um, international ta the, the, the tax laws as they apply to international taxation are drafted in a way that allows them to shift their profits into places where they're taxed at a lower rate. And they do that in ways which don't break the law in any country, but they often do, uh, they often do work in ways which were clearly not what was intended when the law was written. Um, Tax evasion, on the other hand, is the outright hiding of a tax liability from the revenue authority. So tax evasion relies on secrecy because if it's caught, it will be uh, it will be prosecuted by the revenue authority um, and penalised by the revenue authority. Um, tax evasion uh, mostly occurs in, uh, in respect of wealthy individuals. Of course, companies can evade tax too, um, but broadly speaking, the challenge in terms of tax evasion is, is about wealthy individuals um, trying to avoid in particular per personal income tax and other taxes that they might be liable to pay um, by hiding revenue offshore in a jurisdiction, in a secretive jurisdiction, um, where it's to pay, they pay little tax on it, and it's unlikely that the revenue authority will be able to find out that it's there. Now, in the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk mostly about multinational companies and tax avoidance, um, which reflects not so much the importance of one issue rather than the other, but more where the existing research um, is largely focused. Um, and in a future version of this lecture, um, we'll update that to talk more about uh, tax, avoid, tax, tax evasion and individuals as well. So to return to the trilemma, uh, that I mentioned at the start. So we talked about double taxation and we've talked about tax competition. So the final part of this is tax sovereignty. And the argument made by Genschel and Rickson is that you, it would be very difficult for governments to create an international tax regime, a means of cooperating with each other that both solves the problem of double taxation and prevents tax competition without also losing control of their own capacity to set tax laws. Um, without without losing tax sovereignty and that governments have generally preferred to hold on to their tax sovereignty that forced them to choose between a, a regime that prevents double taxation and a regime that present prevents tax competition and they've generally chosen the first 
more recently, there's been much more interest in the problem of tax competition and particularly attention on tax avoidance and tax evasion. And that's created the challenge that governments have needed to try and navigate around a situation in which they either have to accept some double taxation or they have to accept some restrictions on their tax sovereignty. And we'll return to looking at exactly how things are changing later in the lecture. So how do governments approach international tax? What is it that they've done to deal with the challenges I've outlined? So broadly speaking, where we are is a situation in which we have three different sets of standards, which I'm going to talk about. Those standards are tax treaties, transfer pricing, and those two instruments are mostly focused on, uh, on resolving the problem of double taxation in a way which tries to limit the potential for tax avoidance. And then mutual assistance, which is specifically around um, working together to try and deal with instances of tax avoidance and tax evasion. And those standards are delivered through at three different levels. So the starting point is countries' domestic legislation. And a lot of what governments actually do is about getting their own legislation right in a way that, um, out, at, as a starting point, um, believes some of the double taxation that uh, cross-border investment might face um, and which makes it harder for tax avoidance and evasion. Um, but beyond that, there are also binding agreements. And historically, these have been primarily bilateral agreements. So binding agreements between states, um, which, uh, which entail commitments to uh, restrictions on their taxing rights to prevent double taxation um, and obligations to each other to help each other in the area of tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, increasingly, we're seeing new multilateral agreements, and I'll return to that. Um, and then the third area is international standards, generally uh, arrived at, at multilateral level, whereas the binding agreements were primarily bilateral. And those international standards um, are generally voluntary in nature, but there are certain mechanisms through which they become less than clearly voluntary, partly just they're generally they're generally becoming more widely accepted as a norm, but also um, through mechanisms such as peer reviews um, within certain organisations and blacklists as well, which uh, which can make those international standards into de facto um, uh, de facto soft law. So let's look at those three instruments uh, one by one, and we'll begin with tax treaties. So there are today over 3,000 bilateral treaties signed between states. Um, those treaties um, divide up what are called taxing rights. Taxing rights and, uh, are something which states don't need to be given. They, they, they have the right to tax whatever they can um, as, a, as a starting point. But they create this notion that states have taxing rights and which they divide amongst themselves um, over multinational companies, also over individuals. Um, and the primary way they do that is by constraining what's called source taxation. So source taxation is um, taxation of economic activity in your jurisdiction by a taxpayer who's resident somewhere else. Um, and they constrain that source taxation in a number of ways. Um, they impose limits on withholding taxes, which are taxes that governments have historically levied on payments um, that leave the country. Um, such as dividend payments, interest payments, service fee payments, royalties. Um, the second is through uh, the concept of permanent establishment that they create, and that sets a threshold for how much activity a business must do in a country before it becomes taxable on its profits, on its net profits in that country. Um, and the third are then a whole set of uh, diverse restrictions on particular types of tax in particular situations, and one um, increasingly, uh, increasingly controversial restriction is on the ability to levy capital gains tax in certain situations. Some uh, lower income countries have found themselves losing the ability to tax quite significant, uh, to raise quite significant amounts of capital gains tax on large business transactions um, because of the way their treaties are drafted, um, uh, for example. Um, so tax treaties um, have historically been exploited for uh, tax avoidance. There have been recent efforts to try and tighten them up, but that still is a major challenge. Um, uh, and overall, while um, countries typically enter into tax treaties as a way of trying to uh, stimulate cross-border investment, um, the costs 
the revenue costs and the invest and the, the investment benefits are, are quite hard to assess and so it's quite hard to arrive at uh, a conclusive view that tax treaties in many cases have been uh, worth the costs that governments have incurred when they've signed them. So tax treaty is the first part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle is transfer pricing. Um, this is um, a mechanism through which the profits of multinational companies are attributed to the individual countries in which they operate. Um, so whereas a tax treaty is primarily focused on the situation in which you have an investor from one country uh, with an investment in another country or an individual who lives in one country um, uh, uh, raising, earning income in another country, transfer pricing is mostly about a situation in which a multinational company which operates in several different countries and has operations in those countries, um, how you uh, attribute the the profits that it makes from its activities between the different countries in which it's operating. Um, the main way in which that operates is through um, something called the OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines. Um, so that's a soft law, that's a, a piece of soft law drafted at the OECD, um, but which has a, um, a really a kind of hegemonic status. It's, it's um, used much more widely than the OECD. Um, and it's it's not really challenged by any other equivalent piece of guidance, so it, uh, it's hard to hard to really suggest it's not an international standard. Um, the OECD approach to transfer pricing is based on the arm's length principle. This says that um, the way in which we determine how much profit is made in any given country is by looking at the transactions taking place within a multinational. Um, and ensuring that those transactions look like transactions that would take place on an open market between companies trading at arm's length. Um, and the philosophy is that if we can ensure that all those transactions are structured and priced in a way which reflects the arm's length principle, then the profits that will be attributed to each country will be a, um, a fair division of, uh, of uh, reflecting the value that's created in each country within the, the multinational enterprise. Um, and like tax treaties, transfer pricing uh, has often been exploited for tax avoidance. Um, uh, we'll talk a bit about the challenges governments face in implementing transfer pricing rules, but many of the tax avoidance um, headlines that, that, that we see in the news um, come down to schemes that involve transfer pricing. So then the third type of uh, standard is mutual assistance. So whereas the first two, treaties and transfer pricing, are focused on double taxation, mutual assistance is about situations in which a government needs to cooperate with other governments in order to enforce its own tax laws. It needs help from other governments in order to enforce its tax laws to deal with the challenges of tax evasion and potentially also tax avoidance. So the most common form of mutual assistance that has been um, talked about most is exchange of information. So this is um, this is uh, where, because the problem of tax evasion rests on um, hiding information in another jurisdiction, so hiding information from your uh, revenue authority about the money you've got in another jurisdiction, um, this is where um, governments share information with each other to help overcome that problem. Um, so historically, that's mostly been through exchange of information on request. This is where a revenue authority realises as part of an investigation that it needs information from another jurisdiction. Um, it makes a request of that jurisdiction, uh, receives the information and it's able to proceed. Increasingly, though, the, that's accompanied by a new form of exchange or, or, or a more common now form of exchange, which is automatic. So in that situation, bulk data is transferred between revenue authorities, not on the basis of a request, but on uh, just on a regular basis instead. Um, and that's really been that's the most in the last few years as a as a international standard. And it's really been quite a game changer for enforcement. And then there is a third type of exchange, which is spontaneous. That's a situation where one revenue authority realizes it has some information that might be useful for another and uh, and shares it not on the basis of a request or a regular proceeding, but just as a one-off. 
In addition to that, there's other forms of mutual assistance. So, for example, uh, revenue authorities can work together to do a conduct a joint audit of a taxpayer, a multinational taxpayer. Um, and uh, assistance in collection is uh, designed for situations in which one revenue authority has realised that um, a taxpayer owes it money, but it's not actually able to enforce that. Um, that might well be because um, this is a multinational investor who's now left the country, has no assets there, and so there's no way of forcing it to pay. Um, and in that situation, the, the tax authority can go to another country in which would be able to collect the revenue, ask it to collect the revenue on its behalf and remit it over. Now, all of these forms of mutual assistance, they require a legal basis in order for them to take place. Historically, that legal basis has primarily been through bilateral agreements, but increasingly now it's taking place multilaterally. The final thing uh, to say about this is that um, clearly, if you want to make this work uh, and work comprehensively, you don't just need to have countries that would be naturally willing to participate in an exchange because there's a mutual benefit. You also need the countries which have set out to attract uh, money from abroad by offering secrecy. Um, so to persuade those jurisdictions to participate, you need some kind of economic or political pressure. And what we've seen since the financial crisis of 2007 to 9 has been an increasing amount of uh, pressure on uh, jurisdictions, such, uh, tax haven jurisdictions, to participate in mutual assistance agreements um, and to exchange information where previously they wouldn't have been willing. Um, that's come about largely through pressure from the G20 and the European Union, uh, and the US has done it on a unilateral basis too. Um, uh, and that's, again, by bringing jurisdictions which previously weren't willing to exchange into the tent, that's really changed significantly the landscape of international taxation. So those standards that I've just described, many of them have origins in discussions that took place 100 years ago. So let's quickly go over the, the history and the development of the regime that we have today for multilateral tax cooperation. So the story generally is thought to begin in the 1920s and 30s um, with the League of Nations, which at that point was the main forum through which multilateral cooperation on economic matters took place. Um, and uh, beginning in the 1920s, um, there's a series of expert reports which lead to the creation of model conventions. And those model conventions are designed to be a basis through which states can negotiate their bilateral treaties. Um, by 1945, the kind of end of the League of Nations work, you have two prevailing models um, known as the Mexico model and the London model. The Mexico model favours the interests of source states, so capital importing states, and the um, London model favours the interests of capital exporting states, the resident states. Um, that work is taken up by the UN um, in the, uh, soon after the UN's creation, um, but that work never really gets much of a head of steam behind it and it kind of peters out. Um, but in the 1950s, the OEEC, which later becomes the OECD, takes on uh, the, the, the lead role in multilateral tax cooperation and really becomes the preeminent body in which states cooperate. So during this era, 1920s to 1960s, that's as far as we get in terms of cooperation. Um, uh, but the OECD model that's drafted in that period takes um, the increasing number of bilateral treaties between OECD members, which have tended to favour something that looks more like that London model that benefits capital exporting states, um, and turns that into um, a new model, um, which again reflects something looking more like those interests. Although, of course, within the OECD, you will have a different set of interests, but they look more like the interests of capital importing states than it would do if that discussion had taken place in the UN. From the 1970s, there's a couple of things that are different. So the first is the emergence of more and more developing countries, lower income countries, that begin to conclude bilateral tax treaties of their own. Often countries that were under colonial rule became independent, inherited some treaties from their colonial powers and wanted to get rid of those and replace them with ones that reflected their own priorities. Um, so 
in tandem with that, the United Nations picks up this work again, creates a tax committee, which still exists to this day. Um, in 1980, it publishes its first model convention of its own, which looks similar to the OECD, but with some tweaks to reflect um, the interests of lower income countries. And, and then it continues to develop that model through until now. Um, but at the same time as developing countries are becoming more involved in the international tax regime, that regime is facing new problems. And those problems emerge because of the increasing volume and complexity of cross-border economic activity, in particular, the emergence of more and more trading services and of more and more foreign direct investment, um, and in fact, other forms of cross-border investment. And as more capital moves across borders, um, that creates a much more complex picture that the models created in an era in which um, there was much less capital flowing across borders and uh, mostly trading goods, um, really struggle to th those mechanisms really struggle to, to keep up with it. And that's why you have the emergence of this problem of tax havens. So jurisdictions that specialize in exploiting um, the, the, the cross border uh, capital flows in, in connection with the international tax rules that have emerged, that have, that have been consolidated and which allow for capital flows to avoid and evade taxes. Um, the OECD tries to deal with this problem, particularly in the late 1990s with a project which it calls harmful tax competition, um, which uh, is designed to tackle um, uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion issues. But that rapidly becomes much less ambitious. It's renamed harmful tax practices. It really only focuses on exchange of information um, on request. But then things really change following the global financial crisis of 2007 to 9. Um, you get a sudden uh, step up in the level of cooperation on two parallel tracks, really. So there's the tax evasion track, so the exchange of information and mutual assistance track, um, where states um, come to cooperate much more. There's a there's a uh, an intensification of work through the Global Forum, which is a body attached to the OECD, but with many more states involved, which um, conducts peer reviews. And that's a mechanism of pressuring jurisdictions into being more cooperative. Um, and then you also have a shift from purely exchange of information on request or mostly exchange of information on request towards uh, a new uh, regime for exchange of information automatically and that's catalyzed by the US by this piece of legislation called FATCA which um, obligates foreign banks to share information on US citizens with the US Revenue Authority um, if they want to keep access to the US financial markets um, and that cr uh, catalyzes the creation globally of something called the Common Reporting Standard which is a means of states uh, across the world exchanging information automatically. At the same time, or, 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 or kind of with a bit of a lag from that, beginning more 2012, 2013, you have um, this new work on corporate tax avoidance, which is um, given the name Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, BEPS, by the OECD. Um, and it's worth mentioning that during this era, um, the G20 and the OECD are working together. And so it's not just OECD member states who are leading this work. It's also the large emerging economies that are members of the G20. Um, so. The base erosion and profit shifting project is designed to tackle some of the problems uh, in the corporate tax system in those instruments, transfer pricing rules and tax treaties, and also in mutual assistance as it relates to tax avoidance that are enabling uh, multinationals to avoid tax and that have kind of created problems for governments, created headlines about uh, corporate tax avoidance. Um, and so those, um, those negotiations uh, really, they're still, as I record this, underway in something often called BEPS 2 now, which um, uh, contains two components. One is about looking specifically at um, the digitalized companies, and the other is about creating a minimum tax, a global minimum tax that would make it harder for companies to um, attain a really low global uh, effective tax rate uh, through tax avoidance. So that picture really shows. Uh, a, a, that we're in an era for the last 10, getting close to 15 years now, that's quite different to what came before it, an era of much more ambitious negotiations among states and one in which you have a broader franchise in which it's not just OECD states that are involved or League of Nations states that are involved. So just to uh, kind of consolidate what I've just said a bit, um, 
I think the best way of thinking about how the international tax regime looks is to think of it on three levels. So you have this multilateral level at which um, most of what's produced is soft law, and that soft law is produced by the OECD and the UN primarily. This is how it has been uh, really since the 1970s. Um, that's the model of treaties, the transfer pricing standards and so on. That becomes hard law in two ways. Hard law that's enforceable in states through bilateral treaties that states, that states sign with each other, which are legally enforceable in their courts, and also their domestic law provisions, which are of, often based on, for example, the OECD's transfer pricing guidelines. But there's been two big changes since 2008 that are worth considering. The first is the emergence of much more multilateral cooperation, but at a, at a more regional level. Um, and that's led to the emergence of new model treaties that reflect the, the preferences of states that are members of different regional bodies. Um, and also sometimes regional bodies taking a lead in proposing things amongst their members, which are um, more ambitious than what is agreed at multilateral level, but sometimes can shift the balance of negotiations in those um, global bodies. Um, and so the the EU and I think the African Tax Administration Forum are two examples of bodies that have, have to some extent achieved that. The second big change has been the emergence of a whole bunch of new bodies. I've talked already about the Global Forum uh, on um, Transparency Exchange of Information. Um, so that's a body attached to the OECD, but which has many more jurisdictions, including tax havens and including um, uh, lower income countries. Um, on the tax avoidance side, the OECD also created something called the Inclusive Framework, which has the same kind of idea that it involves a much broader number of countries. Um, and then you also have the emergence of new multilateral hard law instruments, which previously um, uh, previously that, that they were quite limited in scope. And now you have these in particular these two instruments. So the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Assistance. Uh, which is a means of creating the legal basis for states to cooperate with each other, to exchange information and, uh, and engage in mutual assistance um, without needing to sign bilateral treaties. And the other is the multilateral instrument uh, to implement some outcomes from the BEPS project, uh, the first BEPS project, and that multilateral instrument um, that amends states' bilateral treaties. So it doesn't have force in its own right uh, outside of the bilateral treaty network, but it does update all of those bilateral treaties without the need for lots of individual bilateral negotiations. So this is a new kind of cooperation amongst states that we've seen in the last decade or so. And then uh, one final thing I think it's worth mentioning is the creation of the Platform for Collaboration on Tax, um, which was a G20 mandated body, which um, obliged the OECD, the UN, and then the IMF and the World Bank also to work together to coordinate their work that relates to taxation and uh, in developing countries, lower income countries. And this is a way of um, creating a more coherent landscape uh, of standard setting uh, and capacity building and um, technical assistance to lower income countries. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the specific issues that lower income countries face. We've largely focused there so far on a history of the international tax regime that's fairly universal in the sense that it doesn't distinguish between the interests of uh, developed and developing countries very much. Um, but in fact, um, if we look at what lower income countries want and need from international cooperation, it is different to what, um, to what uh, higher income countries need and in particular if you listen to the um, the statements that are often made by uh, the governments or the revenue officials from lower income countries you can kind of boil them down into three categories of issue um, so the first is administrative complexity so statements to the effect that the regime the set of standards that has emerged amongst um, higher income countries in the way they cooperate is simply not um, appropriate for the context in lower income countries and that that um, and and that they would like to see something simpler that is easier for them to administer given that they are starting from a position often of more constrained uh, revenue authority capacity the second is the distributional bias so um, as I as I mentioned the model treaties have in them a 
uh, a bias either towards the capital exporting or capital Im importing countries um, and the system as a whole I think it's fair to say has a bias um, towards the capital exporting countries in that it places more constraints on a capital importing or a service importing country to uh, in, in its taxing rights and so there are many statements from lower income countries uh, stating that they'd like to see that changed um, and the final set of statements are around institutional representation so around uh, whereas the first two you might regard as what we would call um output legitimacy so is the do lower income countries regard the international tax regime as legitimate in terms of the content of the standards that are produced but then there's also input legitimacy so the extent to which the the mechanisms through which those standards are developed and maintained and updated do they uh, have a fair representation of different different groups of country in there and um it would generally be fair to say that um the uh, certainly the, the the dominant role of the oecd uh and the, the way in which decisions are made within the OECD still does not reflect um, the um, does not reflect the or does not include sufficient participation from lower income countries if they are to feel ownership over the standard setting that takes place there. And there are many uh, groups who argue that um, in fact the OECD by design couldn't take that role and that a stronger role for the United Nations would be preferable. So I would say that on top of all of these three challenges, there's something else we need to consider, which is the political economy of the situation. Um, and that political economy is both a international, global um, uh, set of issues, but also it occurs inside lower income countries. And I'll come back and talk a bit about that later. So I'm just gonna run through uh, some of the issues that come up in each of those headings that I've, I've just set out. So first of all, under administrative complexity, if we look at the different regimes, uh, the different sets of standards that I talked about, um, if you look at the tax treaty system, um, a system that's based on uh, the need to negotiate a large number of bilateral treaties, um, often with states that have much more experience and much more capacity uh, in their negotiating team, um, that's, a, uh, that's a, a significant hurdle that states have to overcome. In addition, there are certain bits of tax treaties that are drafted in a way that can be um, that can be more complex than might be preferable for lower income countries and one example of that is the anti-avoidance clauses that they include which um which often place quite a high burden on the revenue authority to prove its case um whereas if you look at the anti-avoidance rules you might find in the tax the domestic tax laws of lower income countries you might find that they're often drafted in a way that is more uh that gives the lower income countries um revenue authority a better uh, chance of success in um, in challenging a, a tax avoidance. If you look at transfer pricing standards, um, there's a big uh, discussion around whether the OECD methods um, for transfer pricing that are embodied in the guidelines, whether those methods are um, in their own right the best approach, um, given that they have been escalating in the complexity involved um, but certainly from the perspective of lower income countries I think there's a strong understanding that simplification of transfer pricing is necessary if lower income countries are really going to be able to effectively police the transfer pricing techniques of multinational enterprises and some lower income countries have employed some simplified methods um, uh, to some extent uh, but not as many as there might um, as might be hoped and I think that's largely to do with the dominant role that the OECD standards have um, but some a lot of discussion now around how uh, international tax standards might be made more appropriate to lower income countries focuses on that simplification question transfer pricing is also a way of doing tax that's premised on uh, quite a lot of dispute between the revenue authority and the taxpayer because um, it's quite hard to say objectively that there's a conclusive uh, correct way of uh, viewing a particular transaction um, there's there'll always be different views about the the the, um, the right uh, value to attach to a transaction and obviously it's likely that the revenue authority and the taxpayer will take different views based on what's what's in their interests um, and that often uh, it often goes to court cases and it can also go to disputes through tax treaties between states um, and that's again quite an intensive approach to to, to administering international taxation. If we look at exchange of information, um, 
increasingly low income countries are becoming involved in the international instruments of exchange of information, but they're often not actually being able to benefit very much from them. Um, that can be because it's um, uh, you need to have systems in place to make requests of other of other countries um, or to to be able to meet the confidentiality standards to receive automatic exchange of information um, and so many countries simply don't receive it because they aren't uh, that they, they haven't considered that it's worth their while to invest as much as they would need to be able to do to meet those requirements that are placed on them by the international standards but even countries that do receive them then need to be able to make use of them. So the calculation of whether it's worth investing in the systems to be able to receive and process information is partly based on, well, are we going to be able to have the capacity to then use that information in the way that it, it, it's used by more well-resourced revenue authorities? So that distributional bias relates primarily, though not exclusively, to bilateral tax treaties, um, because those are generally treaties between um, uh, between states where one is one one is seeking investment from the other or one is seeking investment opportunities in the other. Um, and in those situations, that balance between source and residence from a lower income country perspective is is the is going to be really um, an important part of the negotiation. And the point here is twofold. Firstly, that the multilateral models on which negotiations are based have an inbuilt bias. And although you have different models, the OECD and the UN and different regional models, which have set that, that, that balance differently, the, the whole system contains embedded within it a, a bias in the sense of an assumption that the treaty will constrain the source state's taxing rights um, in aspects which maybe one could argue it doesn't need to do at all in order to serve its function. Um, and then secondly, when states come to actually negotiate in individual negotiations, there'll be a big uh, there'll be a big uh, discussion over this source residence uh, balance in the treaty, um, and often the outcomes of the negotiations, even within the parameters set by um, by the models, works against the interests of lower income countries. Some of the big global negotiations currently underway on digital taxation have been uh, are very much around this distributional bias and trying to shift it somewhat in a way which may or may not, depending on exactly the outcome, be of the interest of lower income countries. So I've talked already a bit about the institutional representation debate, which is often really framed in terms of the question of how much influence the OECD should have over uh, multilateral standard setting as it relates to lower income countries versus the UN, given that the OECD's membership doesn't include um, lower income countries. Um, and even if that franchise is expanded to the G20, the same question remains. Um, the OECD's response to that was to create these bodies, the Global Forum and the Inclusive Framework, which, um, which allow developing countries to have a, a seat at the table. Um, but there's still the question of the extent to which doing that, but still in a body which has a, its legacy and its ongoing operations attached to the OECD is ever going to be as representative as um, a body based at the UN. And there are certain aspects of the way the UN Tax Committee and the OECD bodies are designed, which, which also kind of play into that discussion about which is the body in which developing countries are likely to have the best influence. Um, we conducted some influence, uh, some uh, research during 2020 in which we tried to speak with negotiators who had um, participated in in discussions at the inclusive framework at the OECD and this quote summarizes very much the sentiment that we heard a lot I freely express my views and I get the feeling that they are heard but I don't expect to have any influence ultimately when decisions are made now that's a very strong statement and we did find examples in which lower income country negotiators had influenced decisions but that had tended to be um, either when they were in alliances with much larger more powerful states um, or on fairly small matters in which it, it was possible for them to to shift um, the outcome of negotiations but not on larger matters where essentially great power politics was what determined the outcomes um, would a shift towards decision making at the UN necessarily change that for the better? I think that's a hard that's a hard position to to reach a conclusion on. Maybe it would do, but it's also possible that um, actually uh, that would simply replicate 
um, many of the power dynamics that we found inside the OECD bodies to date. So I said that framing all of these uh, discussions in terms of lower income countries, there's a political economy dimension. Um, and and, and I, I want to mention three things here. Um, so the first is um, that although international taxation is very transnationalized in the way that standards are set, um, a lot of the time I think the determining factor in how influential lower income countries are is actually aspects of the political economy in their own in their own domestic setting. So that will be to do with um, the uh, political agendas of uh, of policymakers. So, for example, if policymakers are very focused on tax competition and using tax incentives to do that, that will make that will, that will constrain some of what their negotiators can do. They may have the same view of tax treaties that they want to, to see their country signing lots of tax treaties as a way of attracting investment, and that will hamper their negotiators' ability to, to dig their heels in during negotiations. Um, there's also often a, uh, a, a disjuncture between the policy-making side and the technical side. Um, these are obviously big generalizations, but I think we can say that some of the countries from lower income uh, bracket that are more effective in global negotiations um, and bilateral negotiations are, are more effective because of a good working relationship between the policy making side in the finance ministry and the administrative side in the um, revenue authority. Because often the, the latter group who are uh, doing the legwork of negotiation um, and if they have a um, stronger um, relationship with the policy making side that often means they are more empowered and more uh, um, more equipped to go into negotiations with the finance ministry mandate to adopt a more ambitious position um, so that's the first kind of category um, I've given a fairly um, a very simple summary of that we talk about it more in that research um, uh, which you can find on the ICTD website um, secondly um, I think ultimately there's always going to be different agendas amongst lower income countries and then amongst different groups of other countries. I mean, even the low income country group bracket is not going to have one homogenous set of interests. But we might say that um, there's one set of interests amongst the powerful OECD countries, although they're, they're also split between, for example, the digital negotiations between the US and, and much of Europe. Um, and then also another set of interests in some of the large emerging markets, which is probably different to the smaller lower income countries. Um, and so in that landscape, um, I think there's a real question over the extent to which any viable global consensus is ever likely to reflect the interests of lower income countries adequately, or whether actually the idea that we should proceed through global consensus is always necessarily going to be in lower income countries interests at all i think that's an interesting question to explore um, and finally this is a technically complex policy area one in which as i said often it is um technocratic negotiator uh, technocratic um administrative officials who are the ones who are doing a lot of the negotiating and standard setting in at the transnational level um, and that shapes the way in which global negotiations take place. I think one of the things it means is that um, a less um, a, a less powerful country, if you look at the size of its economy, can have an outsized influence if it has capable uh, and uh, and experienced negotiators, which, which some lower income countries ha have ensured they do have. Um, and that can allow them to punch above their weight. Or conversely, uh, if they don't have that uh, those representatives, then they can have, find their influence diminished. Um, and also that the, the kind of the, the, the technocratic consensus that is the, the kind of core of what um, has led to the stability of the international tax regime for so long, the consensus amongst the community of people who set standards um, is, is something which can't be boiled down to just the interests of individual states. It's also about um, the people who negotiate and the 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 sentiment within a community of of experts um, and understanding that can help understand both the challenges faced by lower income countries but also the opportunities they might have in the future
Just a note about recent developments. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the negotiations that have taken place since around 2018 on the digital economy, or uh, I think technically we've got to call it the challenges posed by the digitalization of the economy. Um, uh, just to say briefly what that looks like. So on the OECD side in the inclusive framework, um, they're working towards a two pillar solution which includes two components. The first, pillar one, focuses on redistributing taxing rights, as I said, towards market jurisdictions. So towards saying that in the instruments that we use, so the, um, the tax treaties primarily, also the way transfer pricing works, um, we should ensure a greater share of the tax base of multinational companies is allocated to um, the places in which they have consumers and users. Now, depending on how that's designed, that could be beneficial for lower income countries. Um, but there are a lot of aspects of the design which are likely to mean it will be very good for larger markets, um, but less good for smaller markets. Um, pillar two um, is not really about the digital economy at all. Um, it's around the creation of a global minimum tax. So the idea is that multinationals will always pay at least a certain proportion of their profits in tax. Um, and in that discussion, which um, it, when you look under the under the hood, it's actually quite a, a complex set of different tax measures. Um, again, there are questions around, well, if you're going to say, if you're going to top up the tax that has been paid in each individual country to ensure that there's a minimum, who's going to get that top up? Is it going to be the resident state in which the multinational is based or the source states in which it operates? Um, and so the design of that pillar two, again, uh, could potentially be beneficial for lower income countries, but it's um, it seems quite likely that it's going to have only limited benefits for them. Over at the UN Tax Committee, um, there's been a series of developments, not all of them specifically focused on the digital economy, but all focused on services. Um, and those developments are um, really, uh, really representing probably a more ambitious position than we see at the OECD in terms of the shift of taxing rights towards uh, towards countries in which digitalized companies have their operations or, or have their user base. Um, uh, so three things that we've seen, Article 12 of the UN model um, has been updated to be more comprehensive in the way it approaches um, software royalties. So payments for software um, under the UN model, now there's a more, a stronger taxing right in the uh, in the country in which the consumer of the software is based. Um, then two new models for the UN, uh, for the new articles for the UN model. Article 12a on fees paid for technical services that allows for a withholding tax to be imposed um, by a country, by a lower income country on payments that go out that go out of it for uh, technical services, management, consultancy, and technical service fees. Um, uh, and then Article 12b, um, that is a way of allowing uh, lower income countries to impose a tax on um, the provision of digital services, certain digital services into its economy. So these are uh, changes which uh, in some cases, but not all, reflect what's kind of already been common practice in lower income countries or else is a very strongly held preference amongst lower income countries. Um, but the extent to which they filter through into actually negotiated treaties will depend um, on the willingness of their treaty partners to, to concede it. So we'll be watching to see what happens there. It's worth just mentioning also then that two regional um, or political groupings have been particularly active in trying to influence the, those multilateral negotiations. So one is the African Tax Administration Forum and one is the group of 24, which is a kind of a, a, a grouping that includes both um, many of the largest emerging markets and then also some smaller countries. Um, and so the emergence of these two bodies as, um, as kind of caucuses for uh, lower income countries within those global negotiations is, is an interesting political development that is also worth watching. So to conclude, the picture I've painted is one in which a century of uh, multilateral tax cooperation and bilateral negotiation has really been changed quite a lot by what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and that change has kind of taken three forms. Firstly, much more in intense and ambitious negotiations between states. Secondly, a focus that has shifted, um, if you think back to the trilemma that I painted earlier on, um, a focus that has shifted um, towards more interest in tax avoidance and tax evasion um, 
uh, or in in changing international tax standards to challenge tax avoidance and tax evasion and to do that is come at the expense of tax sovereignty more hard multilateral tax law and more um uh, incursions into states um policy making capacity and and more pressure on states to comply with minimum standards um, and finally it's got much more diverse players it's no longer purely a cabal of oecd states um, who are setting standards um, it's got more countries involved although the extent to which that involvement is real is um, is still unclear when we look at lower income countries so three tests for uh, for looking forward to see how the outcomes of this new era of cooperation might benefit lower income countries and all of these are tests i'm not i'm not saying either way um, the extent to which they've been met yet so the first is simplification do the reforms that we've seen over the past 10 years produce a simpler set of international tax standards that work um, better for lower income countries secondly redistribution does the overall settlement particularly in corporate tax um, that was biased towards residence countries does that um, start to shift towards something that looks more like what you would have if you had an equal negotiation between residents and source countries um, and finally institutional representation so if you look at the way that international tax standards are set do lower income countries have a um, have a both an institutional seat but also a practical ability to influence um, in the same way that the larger and more powerful states do so those three questions I think are all um, we're waiting to, to see the answers and hopefully in the coming years there'll be more exciting research that will help us to, to reach some conclusions.